medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram update. We're going to talk about this Marburg virus outbreak that's happening right now in Rwanda. So let's talk classification. The family filovirus is a non-segmented, negative sense, SS, or single-stranded RNA. And from there, there is Ebola, which we're not going to talk about today because we're talking about Marburg virus. Now, there are two variants that you should be aware of. One of them is the Lake Victoria, and the other one is Ravn. This one is actually pretty rare. This is the majority of the infections that we see. And filovirus means long and stringy. This is actually what it looks like under an electron microscope. And on the surface of these viral particles, there are glycoproteins, which will be important because this is the protein that the immune response is going to see, and that'll become important later when we talk about immunity and vaccines. So Marburg virus was first discovered in 1967. It started out with Uganda. In Uganda, there were monkeys that were being trapped for scientific research. And they were supposed to go directly to Germany, specifically Frankfurt and a place called Marburg. And the reason why they had to go there was because the factory and the control for the polio vaccines were located in those cities and they were working on polio vaccines and they needed the monkeys for the cellular cultures. When they were going to ship these monkeys to the cities of Marburg and Frankfurt, unfortunately, the Six-Day War was going on at that time, and they could not directly fly from Uganda to Marburg and Frankfurt, and instead, they had to fly to London. So these monkeys were transported to London instead, and as it turned out, the airport workers were on strike. And as a result of that, they had to stay there for two days in an animal locker. In that animal locker were also finches from South America and additional monkeys from Sri Lanka. Now, we didn't know this at the time, but those animals did not introduce the virus. We now know by process of elimination that the virus was actually from Uganda, but it was unknown at that time. After spending a couple of days in London, which were not uneventful, a couple of the monkeys escaped and they had to round them up again. And it's actually interesting that those monkeys did not infect other animals in London. Otherwise, this might not be known as the Marburg virus, but the London virus. Those monkeys were then transported to Marburg, to Frankfurt, later and also to another city, Belgrade. And at that time, that was Yugoslavia. These monkeys were killed right away, but the monkeys that were sent to Belgrade actually were kept alive for an additional six weeks, and they found that they had an excess mortality of about 33%, so there was something wrong in these monkeys. At all three of these sites, people came down with fevers, body aches, muscle aches, very high temperatures, and we'll show you now what happened. So we did not know this at the time, but there's about a five to nine day incubation period. So that means from the time of infection to the first symptoms can be anywhere from five to nine days. Now, the first three to four days, the key there is fever and pretty high fever going up to as high as 39 degrees Celsius. That's about 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. The other thing that you would see is malaise. That means basically just feeling low energy, myalgias, that means having body aches, and headaches. By the first week, or starting to get to day seven, you're going to start to see nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And at this point, this is when hospitalization usually occurs. Many people hospitalized started to have pink eye or conjunctivitis or rashes. By the second week, the fever then drops down to about 38, which is still a fever, but it's not as high. And unfortunately, this is where we start to see hemorrhage, at least in these people that we're looking at in Germany. And we start to see increase in liver function tests. That would be the AST and the ALT. We start to see that the blood coagulation and the white blood cells start to drop. So WBCs start to drop, platelets start to drop as low as less than 10,000. And we start to see bleeding out basically out of every orifice and wherever there is a needle puncture. And basically for those that died, it was between seven and 16 days with an average of about nine days. And those that died were almost always the ones that had hemorrhage. 
Those that survived, there was orchitis. Orchitis is inflammation of the reproductive organs, like the testes and the ovaries. And unfortunately, with this virus, what they found out in this situation is that the virus tends to hang out for a long time, even if the patient recovers and is asymptomatic. In fact, there was a case where a man passed it on to his wife with basically sexual intercourse. There was viral particles that were infectious in the semen that actually infected his wife 120 days out, and that was actually documented. Overall, the case fatality rate for males was 22.5% and for females was 25%. The mode of transmission was done by contact or body fluids, as we mentioned, but not airborne, and there were a number of healthcare providers that came down with the infection as well. Eventually, it was self-limiting and did not turn into a pandemic, but it was, in fact, self-limiting. Finally, they were able to actually identify it and isolate it using an electron micrograph, which shows the initial picture here of some inclusion bodies that were found in cells. This is the one from 1967. Since then, there's been a number of outbreaks. Scientists have found, based on these outbreaks and further testing and investigation, that the reservoir for this are actually in bats. There have been a number of outbreaks that have occurred as a result of people visiting bat caves where miners were working. This is where a lot of the cases were, and you can see here that there were a number of deaths, some as high as 88% mortality. And now there is an outbreak in Rwanda. There's about 56 cases, about a dozen deaths currently. And even though there has not been any confirmed cases in the United States, the CDC is actually screening travelers for Marburg as the outbreak of this Ebola-like disease, as it's called, is growing. This is Marburg, which is in the same family, as we mentioned, but does act differently. And unfortunately, the therapeutics and vaccines that have been developed for Ebola do not work in Marburg. There are, however, other vaccine and therapeutics that are being looked at, and and we're going to talk about that. One of the things that's new and interesting is that Rwanda is going to start vaccine trials for the Marburg disease in a few weeks. This is a vaccine trial from the Sabin Institute that has been tested in animals, and also now safety tests have been conducted in human beings. This is a traditional type of vaccine which uses an adenovirus to code for a protein on the surface of the Marburg virus. This is not an mRNA vaccine. So here's the paper, which I will put a link in the description below, and it's titled Single Shot CHAD3-MARV, which is the Marburg virus. Vaccine in modified formulation buffer shows 100% protection of non-human primate. Again, they're testing the efficacy of this in animals, and they're seeing whether or not it protects against the Marburg virus. And here it does reference the very high case fatality rate with Marburg virus. What they're doing is taking an adenovirus type 3 vectored protein. This is a glycoprotein that is normally seen on the Angola version of the MARV virus. And they're putting it into a viral platform where there is no replication. So you give this virus, there's no replication, and it causes an immune response. And they're doing this challenge in macaques, which are monkeys. And really, the results of this study are just outstanding. They couldn't be better. They found that those macaques that got the virus that were in the control group, none of them survived. But those that got the virus after they were given this vaccination, 100% of them survived. Pretty stark, amazing results here. If you look at serum viral load, in those animals that got the saline, you can see here in black how high the viral loads went. And of course, viral loads are really important in these types of diseases because they actually predict mortality. Whereas those that got the vaccination are in blue, you can see that the viral loads were so small as to be under the threshold of detectability. Looking at viral load again, blue is the vaccinated, and you can see here whether it's tissue viral load, looking at micrograms of RNA, etc., you can see that there was statistically significant improvement. 
Just to be clear, the blue was the viral particles that were at 1 times 10 to the 11, and the red are 1 times 10 to the 6, which is very similar to saline. So you can see here that they're trying to target a amount of viral particles that was somewhere between 1 times 10 to the 6th and 1 times 10 to the 11, because 1 times 10 to the 11 worked really well, whereas 1 times 10 to the 6 did not seem to work much at all. And you can see here for anti-Marburg viral GP or glycoprotein IgG concentration by ELISA, you can see here that on day minus three, before the infection was done, there was no difference between. However, on day 14, the 1 times 10 to the 11 viral particles was superior to the 1 times 10 to the 6th, both at day 14 and day 28. There was funding by the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Overall, it was a positive study, but one that still needed to be repeated in humans and there needed to be safety data. So in January of this year, there was another paper that was published titled Safety, Tolerability, and Immunogenicity of the Chimpanzee Adenovirus Type 3 Vectored Marburg Virus, C83 Marburg, Vaccine in Healthy Adults in the USA, a first in human phase one open label dose escalation trial. And you can see here, they went with the 1 times 10 to the 10 or 1 times 10 to the 11 particle units. And they enrolled healthy adults. So let's go through it here. The vaccine was safe, well tolerated, and immunogenic. They had 93% participation with 5% moving from the area and 3% was lost to follow up. There was no serious adverse events in a population of 40 healthy adults. Now, clearly, that's not powered to find rare events, but you don't really wanna do a big study if it's a phase one trial, because if there is something that's a problem, you don't wanna expose that to many adults. So this is typical for a phase one trial to have not that many subjects in the trial. And you can see here that with the mild to moderate reactogenicity was observed following vaccination with symptoms of the ejection site, pain and tenderness, malaise, headache, and myalgia were most commonly reported. And they did what they were supposed to do. They induced a glycoprotein-specific antibodies that were induced in 95% of the 40 participants four weeks after vaccination. 95% of participants produced a glycoprotein-specific antibody response. Again, that's a specific response against the Marburg virus, and it remained in 70% participants at 48 weeks, so almost a year. So, of course, that was earlier this year in January. Here's a article from the Sabin Vaccine Institute who is testing these vaccines. This is the only vaccine, by the way, for Marburg that has been tested in human beings. There's about three or four others that have not yet been tested, and they have different platforms. This title here is Sabin Vaccine Institute delivers Marburg vaccines to combat outbreak in Rwanda. And you can see here they are offloading it off the plane. This is dated October 5, 2024, and there are approximately 700 vaccine doses, which are going to be used in a trial targeting specifically frontline workers. As we talked about in this pandemic, it is the workers that are going to be put at risk because they are working right next to these patients who could spread it to them in direct contact. Per the approved protocol, approximately 700 high-risk adults, starting with healthcare providers, will be dosed at six clinical trial sites in Rwanda. Pending a request from Rwandan officials and authorization from BARDA, Sabin plans to supply additional vaccines. So you should know that this has not been tested in children, and so therefore it's not going to be tested here in this clinical trial in any children either. And as we talked about, it says here that there's currently no licensed vaccines or treatments for Marburg, which has a mortality rate up to 88%. Sabin's single-dose vaccine based on the CDA3 platform is in phase two trials in Uganda and Kenya with no safety concerns reported to date. Results from phase one clinical trials and non-clinical studies indicate that the vaccine is safe and elicits rapid, robust immune responses. So this is a breaking story that is going to continue to unfold, and we will cover it as that happens. But we'll also educate you on the virus as things unfold as well. There's a lot of interesting aspects that I want to cover in future videos, not the least of which is the fact that we know that Marburg virus shuts down interferon and also interferes with the ability of the adaptive immune system, that is antibodies, from doing its thing when it becomes infected. 
We're also going to talk about the pathophysiology of how Marburg kills in terms of its DIC and the hemorrhagic effect. But I also wanted to remind you that we at MedCram also have a website called medcram.com where we have continuing medical education videos. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications. Check us out at medcram.com where we have more clarity and less time. Thanks for joining us.